I think we've experienced another step change with models, and it's not so easy to see. Okay, all right, let me back up. A few days ago, I had one of those AI moments. You know the one, where you've been working with AI for a while, and all of a sudden it does something that really surprises you. So I dusted off an old project that had a bug, and I decided, just like all of us would have, I'm going to give it to the best models I've got. That was Sonnet 4.5 and Codex Max High. So really the best models, state of the art. So I threw this problem at them, and they both kind of failed. And then I started working with both of them again and again and again. And for an hour, they were in death spirals. There was no way for them to figure out this problem. It is not that complex of a problem, so it was a little bit surprising. But this wasn't actually the AI moment. Only two days later, Gemini 3 and Opus 4.5 had both delivered. So now I had two brand new models to try to throw the problem at. And so I did exactly that. And what happened? Both of them cleared it in one shot. Whoa. These new models didn't just fix the bug. They understood the architecture that caused it and actually reached out and fixed other bugs that were related to it that were not referenced. Pretty amazing. Let me walk you through what I saw, why some models absolutely could not solve the problem and really crashed and burned, and the others solved it with no problem, and why I think this shows that we're at the beginning of system-level AI coding. Let's take a look. Okay, as I mentioned, I pulled out this application. It's a simple Kanban application that I've been working on. It's an area where you can drag different cards around on a Kanban board. But here's the problem. If I drag one card on top of another card, and you'll see this little ghosting where this representation of the card is still in the DOM, that's actually the trick. If I drag this one over another card, you'll see that we run into an error. Okay, so this is just a React bug. It's telling us that something updated state, which triggered a re-render, which updated state again. Pinwheel. All right, so the next thing that I did is I created a branch out of this problem so that I could recreate it for as many models as I wanted to. So now I have a branch of this application, and I described the problem that I had, including the runtime error that you just saw. And I issued this, I put this in as, as a project file that I could tell the system about. So I told Claude, please fix the error seen in circular issue and issued it. And I did the exact same thing with, like I said, Codex Max High. This is the highest thinking, biggest model and brand new model that OpenAI released only a week or so ago. So all of this was brand new, really giving it a shot, actually hoping to solve the problem. So as I mentioned, they don't solve the problem. In fact, let me give you a look at what's actually going on. Okay, full disclosure here. Some of the things you're about to see are full on awesome. This is actually Opus 4.5 solving some of my presentation materials for you and trying to come up with ways that they make sense for us all to ingest together. So all of this is me taking the outputs that you'll see in a second of how these systems think they meant to solve the problem and why, and then building a system of, of kind of description of what it did here. So we're going to walk through this. What's happened? is this cursor line is imagining that you're grabbing one of those cards and you're picking the card up. The moment you pick the card up, we go into this state where there's a ghosted card. Remember the card we were looking at? It is kind of ghosted. That ghosted card gets entered into the DOM here. Now, the change to the DOM makes our system think, oh, wait a second, something inside of the DOM has changed and it thinks now I've got to fire the drag over function. So you're dragging over something. That's important. Where am I supposed to put the card? I should put it at the top. So it decides what I need to do is take this card and slide it up to the top. Okay, that's fine. Again, we have not moved our cursor. This is just what's happening. But what's actually happened on the web page itself is we've changed what objects are underneath the cursor. Okay, that seems to make sense. We put the B task up top just for some fundamental reasons of the way the system was working. And now task A is under our cursor. Well, what does that do? But that fires our drag over again. So it sees task A as the item that's under the cursor at this moment. and says, oh, wait a second, I should render the thing and figure out where it's supposed to go because it's up there right now, but the cursor down here. Let me put it between this card and this card. So what it does is it moves it down. 
Fantastic. However, now we're exactly back where we were in the first place, which then kicks it off to say, oh, now I'm under this thing. What am I supposed to do next? And it decides to move it back up and back down and back up and back down at such a speed that it immediately goes into this maximum depth exceeded problem. So that's what's really going on inside of this actual bug. And the representation of that error kind of describes that. Um, and so what we did is we gave this to Sonnet, as we saw, and Codex, and they saw that error and said, great, I think I know kind of what happens in that space. So what I'll do is I'll go fix the problem. Okay, so here we are in their actual fix. This is, by the way, this is probably the one that was after hours of working with it, trying to get it to solve the problem. But either way, really, that doesn't matter. You'll see in a second. I can still take this. I drag it over the card above. Not surprisingly, exact same problem. And so this was very frustrating. I could not without really getting deep and trying to describe absolutely what they should change to fix the problem, I could not get these systems to solve it themselves. Maybe you're seeing problems like this in some of your environments where the AI just keeps going through a circle and it seems to be fixing either the same problem or related things to the problem but never actually solves anything. This is exactly where I was. And at that moment, I kind of had to step back and say, interesting that I don't think AI right now is ready by itself to fix this problem. So to me, I know I'm a little bit odd in this way, that's a great finding. I'm very excited when I find an edge and I get to the point of saying, okay, so AI is having a problem with this. Let me puzzle about why. So I spent a little bit of time trying to figure out why it got stuck. Hey, I wanna take this moment and introduce myself. If you haven't met me before, my name's Matt. I love doing all of this AI stuff. I love investigating these tools and really spending some time with these models to figure out you know, where their edges are, how we can use them, how they can be used in ways that are not just building applications. I really love doing a lot of this stuff. If you have interest in these kinds of things, please subscribe. Here's what I'm trying to do. And this is a little crazy. I'm a little nervous about even saying this because it's outside of my comfort zone. I'm trying to get to 25,000 subscribers, 25 by the 25th of December, Christmas. You know, I'm just trying to line something up. It's a personal goal. It really does help the channel quite a bit. If you can subscribe, if you're not subscribed at this point, that would mean a lot. Here's the deal. And this is crazy. For me, it, to you, you won't think this is crazy. I will do a video in a full outfit of some kind. I'll dress up like I have no costumes. I do not dress up. That has never been my thing. But I'm more than willing. I'll be a reindeer. I'll be something. I don't know what I'll be. Whatever they have at the spirit costume store or something like that. I'll come up with something and then I'll shoot a fun video as a thank you to everyone that subscribed. So if you have a chance, feel free to subscribe. And really, if you don't, it's okay because I won't have to dress up. I just thought I'd throw it out there. All right, let's get back to it. Okay, so the next thing I did, as I mentioned, once Gemini 3 came out and Opus 4.5, I decided to give the same problem using that branch again to these two systems, giving it the exact same problem set that you saw before. These solved it in one shot. As you can see here, I can move things around. Everything's hunky-dory. So what's interesting about this is absolutely, it solved the problem that we were after. But where I got fascinated is down in here. And yes, again, really, this stuff is brilliant. I did not ask for the UI that you're seeing here. I did ask for it to build some way that I might be able to represent these challenges but this UI is fantastic, so I just have to show this, and all, all responsibility for this goes to uh, Opus 4.5, so this is awesome. But there is another problem that's actually wrapping, kind of turducken style, wrapping our actual problem that we're reporting. You lift one thing, it changes state, which says, oh, I need to re-render some stuff, it moves stuff in the DOM, oh, you're hovering over something, let's change state. So we get into that loop, right? We mentioned that. Outside of that, though, is another system that's actually paying attention to all of the data in the database. And we're using Firestore in this case. And each one of those cards that we saw has five different connections to that database to keep track of the different values that are on it. Not a great design. It's just the way it was. Old application, like I say, fine. But there's a problem in that because every movement, every single movement that you do with your mouse when you're dragging, if you move it one little tiny tick, that's gonna kick off a re-render as we saw. That re-render destroys all of these cards. When we destroy the cards, we are actually removing all of those listeners to the database and then recreating the cards, which 
adds all of those listeners again. And if you had 20 cards, I'm using the example here, if there was a Kanban loaded with 20 items, imagining these were all of the items, and these were each a subscription to the database, then the first time the cards are loaded, they all have five subscriptions to the database. Okay, that's fine. There's 100 total listeners. That's already pretty big. The next step is somebody starts dragging something, and this creates a, a re-render need. This re-render, of course, tears everything down. So we're unsubscribing all 100 of these. Okay, that's not fantastic. But then all of the cards are once again recreated and subscribers are once again added. And then this replays very rapidly, right? As you're moving your mouse, it's tearing down all of them, adding them all. And what's really happening is creating hundreds or maybe thousands of Firestore calls per second. And of course, that ends up creating way too much overhead and React is gonna get into kind of a panic state because too much is going on and the scheduler can't keep up. So that's kind of the internals is what's happening. So this system was going to blow up anyway and it had other pressure going on while we had the one problem. All right, why do I tell you all this? Magically, both Gemini 3 and Opus 4.5 fixed this problem. They do not have this problem. So how did they see both? How did they figure out that there was this internal problem and an external problem as well that was causing potentially even bigger problems? That is what I needed to investigate. So what I did is I went to both of these models and said, or both of the instances of Claude Code or Codex or whatever I might've been using in those cases, and in fact, Gemini CLI for this. And I said, okay, what I need is a full-blown write-up of what change you found, uh, what, what problems you found, what changes you wanted to put in place, why you put them in place, give me the actual code, um, give me the rationale for it, et cetera, et cetera. So a very good diagram or document from each one of these systems, all the way from Sonnet to Codex to Gemini 3 and Opus. So now I have four documents, and what did I do with those? Of course, I gave them back to either Opus or back to Gemini and said, can you do an evaluation and figure out why one of these that did not work and one of these that did work are different? And those findings were stark. Okay, indulge me for a moment here. I have to call out both Gemini and Claude for this work. Their ability to take these complex documents that are these full write-ups of what each model thought and why it solved the problem the way it did and be able to turn it into something that's representative and something you could actually educate others by or actually even understand the problem yourself. I cannot highly advise this enough. If things are being solved or if there are problems inside of your code in some way that you're trying to figure out what's going on, ask the model to write you a very solid report and use that report with one of these models and say, please give me some kind of visualization that will help me understand what's going on or kind of an infographic system to walk me through the problem. So we're gonna look at Gemini very briefly and just show, because it did a great job. This is when I shared what Claude did, the Sonnet model, as well as the Gemini model. And these are the differences of what it, it fixed. So Claude went and fixed the one problem that we saw and Gemini fixed both that one problem and the other problem that we were talking about. And all the way down, it's it's representing a different version of the the information here. And it's worth saying at the bottom, I really like that that Gemini's definition was Claude acted like an emergency room doctor stabilizing the patient. Gemini acted like a surgeon removing the internal defect. And that's really it. One is seeing this as a system. Now let's go take a look at what Claude did with this. Okay, once again, great write-up that really tries to bring you through the whole problem. This is the Claude, uh, actually this is Opus 4.5's output. Um, and it, so it describes the error, what's happening. The two models were given the same code base, diagnosed, this is what, this is focused on React patterns, this traced the execution paths. 60% um, solution with Claude and 100% with Gemini, et cetera, et cetera. Some diagrams to show the two different modelings that occurred and why they occurred, uh, and then what the combined effect was, how they interact with one another, how this is an intersection between two different problems, um, actually all the way down into the diagnosis of the changes that they gave. So this would be just a brilliant write-up of this is what happened in this bug, here is everything that I found, and kind of a description of why those things matter for anyone to consume, 
rather than just a technical diff in some side of GitHub or something like this. So I find this write-up itself to be kind of magical. But the bottom line, it says, is Claude's, solution, Claude's solution treated symptoms as uh, at the React pattern level. Jim and I traced the actual execution paths to find two interacting circular dependencies and proposed fixes that addressed both at their source. And this is it. That is the magical moment. It is understanding that these systems, I pointed them at one problem. And that problem is in a completely different architectural space than where the other problem is. So it went and attacked. Claude and Codex both attacked that problem. And when I came back and said, nope, there's still problems, and I was not unsophisticated in the way that I was trying to hint, why don't you look at other problems? Why don't you look broader? And it could not get off the one bone that it had, which is I see that there can be more efficient use of the different React elements. So let me create callback usage and use memos to kind of objectify things and make sure that they don't re-render too often but none of that was actually the problem. These are all symptoms that it was imagining those must be the disease, and that's not what was going on. But both Gemini and Opus took a step back and took a look at the trees and said, wait, there's a forest here. Let us figure out what else is going on. And that's magical. This is something these models have not done yet. I think this is new and very, very exciting. Okay, so I'm not trying to represent that we're done. This is the end. Welcome to the end of software development. Nothing at all like that. But this to me is that first glimpse at a step change. I like looking for the step changes where you can say, wait a second, this was doing pretty good last week. And this week, wow, it feels really good. In fact, even my interactions and conversations with it, as you saw in some of these diagrams, were really well-tuned for me to understand what it's saying in a way I always find Claude to be very meaningful in the way that it talks to me, but it is it is just flat out better right now. I'm not sure what they did in this open for Opus 4.5 uh, model. It is much better than the Sonnet 4.5 model, and the Sonnet 4.5 model is great, but I've been working with Opus 4.5 since it released. I just haven't stopped after doing this, and it has chewed through literally everything I've given it without failure. I am not getting errors back. I'm not getting lint loss back. I'm not getting a bunch of missed requirements. And the fact that it actually takes a look at the entire system that I'm talking about when I'm asking it questions, I can feel that difference. And this is that example. So I, I, I hope you see something here. I believe this is a small but truly meaningful delta that is a that's a title shift for us. If you remember at the beginning of the year, we were copying code out of something like ChatGPT and pasting it into our code. We were getting to a place where you could replace whole functions with tab replacements and those kinds of things. And then magically cursor came along and said, oh, I can reliably actually write an entire file that was not there before. That was an AI moment. That was one of those moments. That's where we started this year. And we're starting to end this year by these systems actually having awareness of an entire system. If you work in an enterprise and you work with very complex nested systems, I know you run into this problem because I do as well. It cannot understand the whole. It just has a problem. You need to focus it in on moving parts. I think we're seeing the very beginning. This is just the beginning, but it's the very beginning of system AI coding. I think this is that moment where we will look back one day and go, okay, there was a KT boundary here, and we just walked through it. All right. I hope you found some of this fascinating. Obviously, I find this very fascinating, very excited by it. Thanks for coming along for the ride on this one, and I'll see you in the next one.